Nine months after British and French forces rolled their tanks onto the Western Front in World War I, Germany readied a wholly new kind of counterweapon. Driven by the shocking and surprise appearance of a new mechanized foe, German generals contracted Waffenfabrik Mauser AG to build the first anti-tank rifle of its kind in history. It was the only such weapon used during World War I. The Germans made sure to distribute as many as could be manufactured to its soldiers, producing around 15,800 of them, to the point that they became the terror of tanks on the Allied side. Battle of Cambrai Demand for an anti-tank weapon came after the Battle of Cambrai. During the conflict, an intense British attack provoked the Germans to conduct their most significant counterattack since the war began in 1914. Cambrai, the French province of Nord, was a crucial supply point for the German Siegfriedstellung, also known as the Hindenburg Line. If the British and the French took the town and the Borlon Ridge a couple of miles away, it would weaken the German line's position. Thus, the Allies sought to conquer it with their full force. The Germans needed to meet and exceed that effort to defend it. Widespread trench warfare crippled battlefields of World War I. The nations involved increasingly introduced armored plates for their defense and armor-piercing ammo to gain an advantage over the enemy. The European countries used stunty, advanced rifles to break through the armor plating. Both British and German forces transported guns, usually reserved for hunting big game in Africa, into the European front. When British tanks arrived at the Battle of fliers cossolet in September of 1916, the war changed. Soon after, the French also employed tanks. Once the British brought their Mark IVs to the Battle of Messines Ridge, the Germans realized that their 7.92mm armor-piercing bullets were insufficient. The Battle of Cambrai broke out with a British assault, conducted by two full corps of troops on November 20, 1917. Over a thousand guns were used in a preparatory barrage. While the smoke still lay thick between the British and Germans, 400 unexpected British tanks emerged. They crushed the wire meant to stop invading troops and completely overwhelmed machine guns with cannon fire. It was the first time an army of tanks had entered the war. The Germans trembled. They had no specialized weapons to counter this assault, and few units had ever even experienced tank warfare. The soldiers had few strategic or mechanical tools to stand their ground in the face of impossibly armored vehicles. The day turned out a victory for the British, albeit at the cost of 4,000 troops. Of their tanks, 65 were destroyed, and 120 were left in atrocious conditions from mechanical breakdowns and getting stuck in shell holes. Although the tanks struck fear in the hearts of their enemy, the Mark IV was still a somewhat unreliable machine. The British left a gap in the German line, which was quickly filled by reinforcements. Although the British offensive was forced to draw back, they knew their most significant potential to end the stalemate on the Western Front was with tanks. As the Allies planned, German military commanders also assembled to defend their line. The Germans became aware of the newfound British potential to defeat them after the arrival of the 400 tanks. Since tank attacks were bound to increase, the Germans set out to develop anti-tank weaponry. The moment marked the beginning of a century-long problem of how nations and frontline fighters should deal with tanks. Although the German military would enter World War II with its own tank command, the Imperial German Army of World War I hadn't prepared. In fact, they had only 20 of their A7Vs, a large, slow-moving machine whose numbers didn't amount to much. Therefore, the Germans focused their efforts on combating tanks through techniques and armament. While the Germans needed tanks desperately, time and resources stretched so thin this late in the war required a different solution. Development As a response to the increasingly severe threat of Allied tanks, the German army tasked Waffenfabrik Mauser AG to create a specialized rifle to overcome these vehicles. They produced a 13.2mm rifle named Tank Abwehrgewehr M 1918, also known as Tankgewehr. It was the first anti-tank rifle in the entire world, and surprisingly not a particularly complex weapon. Essential was the weapon's upscaled bolt-action rifle, heavily inspired by the Mauser action rifle. A single-shot 13.2 by 92mm Tank und Flieger, or tank and aircraft ammunition weapon, the Tiegewehr was semi-rimmed with a bottleneck cartridge. Its sights projected 500 meters away. The weapon's projectile was encased in a steel barrel. Also, as part of the new modifications, a piston grip and a bipod were introduced. Yet it was far from perfect. For one, it required manually reloading with each tip. Furthermore, the recoil was intense. This made it challenging to shoot off multiple rounds. While the tank of air was created as a stopgap measure, the initial plan was different. Initially, the Germans wanted a dual-purpose machine gun to go with the Tank und Flieger cartridge. Unfortunately, the proposed weapon was far too complex to be developed in time. So instead, they went with a bolt-action gun. Once these were produced, they were rushed to the front lines. Massive for a rifle, the gun measured in at an impressive length of 66.5 inches, weighing 41 pounds. 
The pistol grip was operationally essential, but the lack of a muzzle brake and any mechanism to reduce recoil made it a challenge for troops to use. In fact, soldiers reportedly felt uncomfortable shooting. It was no doubt risky to use, as it put a target on the operator's head. In combat. There's been some academic and historical debate about the effect and success of the weapon in combat. Claims from wartime reports state that the ammunition of the tank Gewehr was capable of piercing 22 mm of armor plating, albeit at close range. Furthermore, the armored plate required a 90-degree angle for optimal results. However, this was rarely the warfighting reality. The presence of spaced armor plating and the slant of most battlefields reduced the weapon's penetrative ability significantly. The gun proved useful in specific ways. Spalling or scabbing the inside of the tank produced casualties, sending shrapnel at the crew. Furthermore, the weapon was capable of carrying ammunition into the tank's internal components. Shooting the engine or electronic systems was particularly useful. The Germans received two or three of these guns per regiment. The anti-tank rifles were on the front line starting in May 1918. However, they weren't being produced or distributed at an amount that would turn the war in Germany's favor. Nevertheless, by September, the Western Front had around 4,600 Tankgewehrs. The German infantry troops and anti-tank units received specialized training and equipment that summer. Each rifle was operated by two soldiers, a primary gunner carrying the gun, and the other burdening the two shoulder bags holding 20 of the TUF rounds, as well as an ammunition box that had an additional 72 cartridges. As the weapon was integrated into the front lines, German soldiers progressed with anti-tank tactics, exploiting the powerful rifle to full effect. Since most Allied tanks were slow, they were vulnerable to the combination of rifle shots, bundled grenades, and other charges when support was scarce. Anti-tank teams assembled to hit as many of these weaknesses as possible. The Germans also created the SMK Spitzgesuch mit Kern armor-piercing bullet, which performed phenomenally at close range. Rounds of the ammunition were distributed to the riflemen of the anti-tank units. Some German machine gun units received a bullet belt or two as well. Light artillery and mortars were placed in areas likely to endure massive tank attacks. By the end of the war, Mauser produced over 15,000 Tankgewehr M1918s. Machine gun version. Next, the Germans introduced an upgraded weapon to fulfill the anti-tank and anti-aircraft roles as a follow-up to the Tankgewehr. They developed the Maschinengewehr 18 Tankgewehr, better known in its short form MG-18 TUF. It was a dual-purpose heavy machine gun, designed as the war drew to a close. In October 1917, Germany dangled a weapon development contract to any company that could develop this weapon. Six companies submitted proposals for an automatic gun that could fire the brand new 132 by 92 mm SR ammunition, even more effective at destroying armored vehicles. They were designed and produced by the Polter Cartridge Factory. Two companies emerged as finalists, Rheinmetall and Maschinenfabrik augsburg nürnberg also known as MAN. Rheinmetall proposed using a top-mounted pan magazine such as a Lewis gun. MAN offered a firearm with an ammunition belt design. After both were tested, MAN's design was chosen by the German army in August of 1918. The resulting MG-18 TUF was basically a modernized version of the MG-08 heavy machine gun, which in turn was based on the Maxim gun. The new gun was belt-fed, operated with a toggle lock, and featured a short recall. It also required water to cool down after heavy fire. Most importantly, it fired the same armor-piercing ammo as the Tigewehr. The belt had 75 rounds for anti-tank operations, while another 30-round magazine was used against aircraft. The machine gun was set upon a wheeled carriage, requiring a six-man crew. Although 4,000 machine guns were ordered for production, only about 50 were actually built before the war ended. None were ever used in combat. The design never progressed into mass production after the Treaty of Versailles decimated Germany's economy and prohibited arms production. The Hindenburg Line while the Tankgewehr was the only anti-tank rifle to see action during World War I, other nations still attempted to recreate an even more effective anti-tank rifle. The British worked on the Boys anti-tank rifle, introduced in World War II. Still, no copycat rifles saw the same level of efficacy as the Germans. As winter rolled in in 1918, the Allies broke through the Hindenburg Line using an array of tanks, artillery weapons, and intense infantry assaults. In these decisive battles, supported by the entry of the United States of America, Germany's supply of Tankgewehr M1918 guns was not enough. 